Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. I realized I was going to say good morning, but it's really good evening to all of you in India. And I want to give my thanks to both Ida Puni and Dr. Guillermo Gutierrez for inviting me to give this talk. Let me just pull my slides up. Are you able to see my slides? Oh, no, ma'am. Okay, let me try this again. We can't see your slide, but We can see you. <laughs> yes, no. Are you seeing a single slide then? No, you are in a presentation mode. Please go to the yep. full view. Yes. Okay. I should be in full view. Are you not seeing full view? And can you right click on your screen once? Just right click on your screen. Oh, yeah. High presenter view. Click on high presenter view. Yeah. Okay. That should be you. Good. Uh, no, uh, now they don't full screen mode just. This slide show mode, uh, switch on the slide show mode, please. You know, I'm going to try this. I'm going to just try something else. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, today I'll be discussing the definition and interpretation of remission of type 2 diabetes. And uh, my intention is to provide some clarity around this topic, although I'm hoping to be a little bit provocative and maybe actually leave you with more questions than answers. So, uh, not able to advance my slides. Just click on your screen once and then try changing them. There we go. So um, I'm, much of this information is derived from the uh, American Diabetes Consensus Statement that was published in these four journals in 2021. And this was the consensus writing group, which consisted of uh, deemed international experts. Um, and I was privileged to contribute to that. I'm highlighting Professor Knox's name simply because he was generous enough to provide me with a couple of slides for this talk. So I have really two objectives, one of which is to explore the concept of remission as it relates to diabetes but also uh, explore that concept with respect to other conditions. And then I hope to facilitate our understanding that remission of type two diabetes is fundamentally driven by weight loss. So um, there has been a complete paradigm shift in uh, change and emphasis to treat or manage obesity in order to effectively manage and address the physiology of type two diabetes. And so we know this now because glycemia can revert to normal in some people with type 2 diabetes, either spontaneously or after medical or surgical interventions. And in some people, normal glycemia can persist after discontinuation of glucose lowering pharmacotherapy. However, the terminology for describing this process and objective measures for defining it were lacking and long-term risks versus benefits of attaining normal glycemia had not been well-defined. So we all know, because uh, there's been a lot of discussion, I imagine, at this conference that therapies targeting metabolic control and type 2 diabetes have vastly improved, and some also result in substantial weight loss and have downstream pleiotropic effects, <clears throat> such as the glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist, and the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors that you were all just discussing. 
We've made uh, many advances in surgery and uh, endoluminal interventions <clears throat> that parallel surgery. And then, of course, uh, there have been intensification of uh, behavioral and lifestyle managements that have led to successful remission of type 2 diabetes. And our ex experience with these sustained improvements in glycemia have highlighted the need to reevaluate the terminology and definitions of diabetes remission to guide clinical care and research. <clears throat> so the purpose of the 2021 updated consensus statement was to propose suitable definitions <clears throat> excuse me, and ways to assess glycemic control. Is it lack of detection of the disease based upon diagnostic or laboratory studies or the absence of ongoing treatments? So I want to talk about this. So this is neoplastic disease as an example of a relentlessly progressive disease, nevertheless responding to therapy and active disease remission and relapse are mutually exclusive categories, somewhat depending upon the sensitivity of the detection methods. And as you can see, time is on the x-axis and y is disease severity based upon neoplastic cell load on the y-axis. And here is just the detection threshold and beyond which uh, that person is considered having active disease. Now, when we employ or apply effective therapies, uh, that individual can achieve partial remission or even complete remission below that diagnostic threshold. Um, but we do need to be very aware that relapse, of course, can occur. Now, I want to give this example of hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which is usually treated by lumpectomy followed by radiation therapy, sometimes chemotherapy, but uh, many women can achieve remission. But how is that remission defined? Again, is it the absence of detectable tumor on imaging or margins free of disease on anatomic pathology? And what about post-treatment therapies? For many, many women, it's recommended that they take letrozole or tamoxifen or Rimadex for a period of five years. And what about surveillance? How does that factor into defining remission? If we're monitoring three months, that's very different than monitoring at one year intervals. And perhaps we can only consider remission when we're at retrospectively, that is time to recurrence or disease-free survival. I wanna give another example. This is an autoimmune disease with which I'm sure you're all familiar and can commonly uh, occur with people with type one diabetes. And here is just the composite of clinical findings such as diarrhea or weight loss, or even an extra intestinal manifestation such as arthritis. Uh, diagnostic procedure is really a small intestinal biopsy. And uh, of course, uh, there are biomarkers such as the anti-transglutaminase uh, uh, antibodies. Again, time on the x-axis and the GI symptom activity score on the 
at a y-axis, and, and here again is the detection limit, this threshold being somewhat ar arbitrary because there is a lot of intra-individual, not just inter-individual um, variability. But nevertheless, this is a waxing and waning uh, disease. And <clears throat> the only sort of uh, therapy is uh, a uh, dietary restrictions. So we know that treatment is elimination of gluten uh, from diet. But what if gluten is inadvertently consumed and symptoms flare for one to two days? Do we consider that person no longer in remission? Conversely, what if someone purposefully consumes an ad libidum diet of gluten? Um, so they're not adherent to dietary restrictions for a period of time. But let's say they do not have any overt symptoms. Can we consider that individual to be in remission? because they have disappearance of symptoms, because we are unlikely to biopsy that person in the absence of symptomatology. So I'm gonna leave the, you to ponder that. So the criteria for type two diabetes mission that was decided upon was that it should be defined as a return of hemoglobin's A1C of less than six and a half percent that occurs spontaneously or following an intervention and persists for at least three months in the absence of usual glucose lowering therapy. And I'll get to that in a minute. And what are those interventions and then temporal factors in determining remission? So uh, just as an aside, when hemoglobin A1C is determined to be an unreliable marker of long-term glycemic control, fasting plasma glucose of less than 126 milligrams per deciliter or an estimated hemoglobin A1C of less than six and a half percent calculated from continuous glucose monitoring values can be used as alternate criteria. But the requirement was this, a diagnosis of remission can only be made after all glucose lowering agents have been withheld for an interval that is sufficient both to allow waning of the drug's effects and to assess the effect of the absence of drugs on A1C values or other diagnostic criteria, even when glucose lowering therapies are used for other purposes. For example, SGLT2 inhibitors for heart failure or renal protection. And we had a discussion before, our cardiologists are prescribing these uh, very readily. The GLP-1 receptor agonist for cardiovascular risk reduction or weight loss metformin for PCOS or other insulin resistance syndromes or for just as purported downstream positive outcomes. Now, <clears throat> these uh, may not be feasible uh, to stop, nor may be worthwhile to stop. And in that case, diabetes remission cannot really be uh, ascertained. Uh, the group also recognized that some drugs have a modest glucose lowering effect, but are not indicated for glucose lowering, as is the case for some weight loss drugs. And because these drugs are not used to manage hyperglycemia specifically, they would not need to be stopped before a diagnosis of diabetes remission can be uh, made. And this was the case, for example, with Orlistat. So I want to turn now and talk about sort of the circumstances or context in which remission can be achieved. And nobody knows this condition better than your chair, Dr. Guillermo Pierrez, who's been studying for probably 20 plus years. As we all know, ketosis prone diabetes is usually acute without clear precipitating etiology, although there's usually some stress and associated with impaired insulin secretion and action, and intensive insulin management up front results in reversal of that glucose toxicity and eventual improvements in beta cell function and insulin sensitivity within a really short period of time, usually one to three months, at which time insulin is usually discontinued. And that normal glycemia or near normal glycemia may persist for uh, months to years. So this is if you will, a classic or representative um, condition in which diabetes remission is achieved. Let's turn and now talk about a lifestyle intervention. 
So this uh, was the seminal uh, study published in Lancet called the Primary Care-Led Weight Management for the Remission of uh, Type 2 Diabetes, or the DIRECT trial. And this was to determine whether intensive weight management within routine primary care could achieve remission of type 2 diabetes. And it was an open-label cluster randomized trial done in general practice clinics stratified by sex and practice size in the north of England and Scotland. The intervention comprised a structured intensive weight loss program delivered by a nurse or dietitian that included very low energy diet in the form of total diet meal replacement for 12 weeks, followed by gradual reintroduction of a low calorie food-based diet. The control was usual diabetes care, and I'm just showing you the baseline characteristics on the bottom. They had a large uh, representation um, from men. These were middle-aged people with mild to moderate uh, obesity with relatively new onset type 2 diabetes of, of a mean a duration of three years. Nevertheless, 75% of the participant population were taking oral diabetes medications at baseline. Now, these were uh, stopped at the initiation of the intervention, but could be later reintroduced when needed. So here I'm just showing you on the right panel, the percentage achieving diabetes remission in the blue in the intervention group and gray in, in the usual care group. And as you can see, it was markedly better. There are 48% of the participants in the intervention and group achieving diabetes remission at 12 years defined by hemoglobin A1C of less than 6.5%, again, without a drug therapy for a period of at least two months. And that was still very durable or sustained uh, at 24 months, a little bit less, 10% less, but still good, uh, compared to only 3% in the usual care group. And here I'm showing you on this left panel, the percentage of proportion uh, achieving diabetes remission uh, by weight loss. And this was driven, of course, <clears throat> by the intervention group who lost considerable amounts of weight. But as you can see, the more the, or the greater the percent weight loss, the more likely one is to achieve remission. And we now know from other studies that have been recently published, that we used to sort of anchor on 10%, but it's probably uh, clearly better uh, if one achieves 15% or more weight loss. Now, that's very hard to do, but nevertheless, that's the threshold that, that we should be um, uh, driving. Here on the right is the, again, let me just remind you that uh, three quarters of the participant population were taking uh, drugs at baseline. And you can see out at two years in the intervention group, only 40% were on oral diabetes medications. There was obviously a worsening in the usual care group where 84% were uh, taking uh, diabetes. So lifestyle management can lead to uh, type two diabetes remission and it's uh, relatively durable. So I wanna turn now and uh, talk about bariatric surgery. And this was a really well done, well conceived trial that was recently published in um, Diabetes Care entitled Effect of Banded Ruin Y Gastric Bypass versus Leave Gastrectomy on Diabetes Remission at Five Years among patients with obesity and type two diabetes. This is a blinded um, <clears throat> randomized clinical trial. And in fact, uh, these were double blinded in that that patient and assessor were uh, blinded. This is a study of 114 patients, 52% of whom were uh, female, to determine whether a silastic ring, so think of gastric banding on top of Lewin Y gastric bypass compared to laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy produced superior diabetes remission at five years. And this was a relatively diverse population, including indigenous peoples of New Zealand. Part of the reason for this study was to demonstrate that adding that silastic ring on top of Ruin Y could lessen weight regain and to demonstrate that type 2 diabetes relapse was tied to weight regain. So here I'm just showing you the baseline characteristics and you can see they're stratified by duration of diabetes and some having diabetes for longer than 10 years. They had really suboptimal control with uh, baseline hemoglobin A1Cs. Uh, in the 7.9% range. Uh, and as you can see, they were moderately to severely obese. 
But I'm just showing you the table from the paper of the primary and secondary endpoints at five years, which I have blown up in the next slide. So with most of the bariatric surgery uh, literature, the primary endpoint is usually a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6% without uh, diabetes medications. And as you can see, 48% uh, of the Wu and Y with the silastic ring achieved that uh, <clears throat> compared to only 31%, which is uh, uh, a uh, odds ratio of difference of 4.2. I'm going to just use the secondary endpoint just to uh, align ourselves with the um, consensus report. So a hemoglobin A1C of less than six and a half percent, where uh, 33 or 62 percent achieve that in the ruin Y with the silastic ring, compared to only 51 percent in the laparoscopic uh, sleeve group group. So the this, uh, the primary outcome, the hemoglobin A would see less than 6% without any glucose lowering medications um, <clears throat> was uh, uh, just excellent. Um, we do know that nadir hemoglobin A1C was, re was uh, reached by about 24 months after both procedures. And it was maintained, as I'll show you on the next slide, through to five years on fewer diabetes medications. Diabetes remission at five years was more likely after the sleeve at 47% compared with, I'm sorry, ruin Y at 45, 47% compared with sleeve gastrectomy at 33%. There was missing data on six individuals, but diabetes remission was related to the magnitude of weight loss. Participants who underwent laparoscopic ruin Y gastric bypass with the sling had a greater percent body weight loss from baseline than those who underwent sleeve gastrectomy. And this was about 27% versus 16% with an absolute difference of 11%. And the difference in absolute weight change, as I'm showing you on this graph from baseline between those who underwent uh, uh, sleep, uh, ruin Y gastric bypass versus sleep was 12.2 kilograms or uh, a difference of 4.7 kilograms uh, per meter squared or reduction in units of BMI. So here I'm just showing you on the top, top panel a uh, change in hemoglobin A1C from baseline out to 60 months um, in the ruin Y gastric bypass group in the closed circles and in the open circles, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. And as you can see, again, they reached their nadir A1C at about 24 months. And this was relatively sustained for those uh, who underwent the ruin Y versus those um, who underwent sleeve. And then you can see, as I told you before, uh, the reduction in BMI. Uh, and clearly the weight loss was greater uh, in the upfront in the ruin Y gastric bypass and uh, relatively well sustained compared to the uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. So <clears throat> what was very compelling was if you look at insulin, uh, nearly 25% or a quarter of the population was taking that at baseline and very few were taking it uh, at follow-up, although clearly superior in the ruin Y compared to laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. And also uh, nearly three quarters of the participants in the uh, silastic ring ruin Y gastric bypass were taking no drugs at five years, 58% uh, in the sleeve gastrectomy group. Uh, but there were a handful, you know, a quarter of the patient population in the ruin Y gastric bypass, although this was worse for sleep gastrectomy, were taking one or more drugs at follow-up. So I want to turn and talk about uh, uh, incretin therapy, and I'm just going to give the example of this uh, novel dual incretin therapy, though it will be triple therapy on the market pretty soon. These are uh, GIP, GLP-1. Uh, and they work on uh, many receptors and tissues. And here I'm just showing you the comparison of glucose lowering mechanisms active after bariatric surgery on the left and with terzepatide treatment, the treatment with a GIP GLP-1 uh, receptor coagonist on the right. And uh, they uh, parallel each other. The only difference is, is that uh, after bariatric surgery, these are more robustly and endogenously secreted, 
whereas we have to administer these by an injectable or these are exogenously uh, administered. But is active management, that is, you know, medication therapy to achieve a target A1C necessarily failure of the other intervention. And I, I do want to try and talk about what is the duration and frequency by which we are assessing remission. So subsequent testing to determine long-term maintenance of a remission should be done at least yearly together with the testing routinely recommended for potential complications of diabetes. And ongoing attention to a healthy lifestyle is critical. And that is true for all of these modalities. The risks and benefits of therapies that potentiate weight gain, and we use a lot of medications in the treatment for other conditions that are associated with obesity that actually potentiate weight gain, really need to be carefully considered. And these therapies avoided when possible. So the consensus statement is based on expert uh, opinion. It is not a clinical guideline, but it proses terminology and a framework for discussion to facilitate future research and support future clinical guidelines. But areas in need of research are that validation of using hemoglobin A1C cut point of less than 6.5%, validation of the timing of glycemic measurements, evaluation of the effects of metformin and other drugs after remission is established. After diagnosis of remission, the non-glycemic therapeutic role of metformin and other drugs needs to be established. And evaluation of non-glycemic measures during remission, that is, what's the role of changes in neurohormones or peptides after behavioral, pharmacologic, or surgical, or all interventions in altering the risk of relapse or other clinical outcomes. And then finally, research of duration of remission given the various interventions and how data are collected and analyzed. And I- Thank you, Dr. Alka. Come, I'll just make a comment. Because, because we are running, running short, short of time, time I, I will, will 